Hey everybody, Kimberly here, and I am really excited to share with you my take on Daybreak, and not just that, the three things that really work for me that I felt energized by. Because Daybreak is a cooperative game about stopping climate change, and it does not stop at the pitch, nor does it stop at the game name or the concept. It goes even further than you think. This video was brought to you by Noble Knight Games. More about them at the end of the video. In Daybreak, you'll build the mind-blowing technologies and resilient societies we need for a warming planet. Each player takes the role of a different world power, China, Europe, the United States, and the majority world. All of you have a shared goal, cut carbon emissions before it gets too hot or too many communities are put into crisis. At the beginning of the game, everyone is generating massive amounts of carbon cubes from dirty energy and emissions tokens on their player boards. Some of these cubes will be sequestered by tree and ocean tokens on the central board and have no negative effect. But you're all emitting way more carbon than the planet can handle. Those excess cubes go directly onto a thermometer that tracks global temperature rise. Once an entire row is filled with cubes, a temperature band is added, representing the planet heating up by 0.1 degrees Celsius. And if you ever have eight temperature bands, you all lose. For each temperature band, you'll roll a planetary effects die, which represents the planet reaching critical ecological tipping points and makes the game more challenging. Rising temperatures also make you draw more crisis cards, which all reflect the various real-world impacts of climate change. Crisis cards are what endanger your communities, and if any player has 12 or more communities in crisis, everyone loses. So, how do you protect your communities? Build social, ecological, and infrastructure resilience. The more resilience tokens you have, the more protected you'll be. So the first thing I really like about Daybreak is the simultaneous play where players have this autonomy as a world power, but they're also taking into consideration the other players at the table because you are all working together. No matter what world power you control, one of four, you can't do it alone and you cannot live in a bubble, but you also can't spread yourself so thin by helping other world powers that you are neglecting your own. And so there is a fine balance of players deciding what they need to do and how they can help the larger group, which is everybody at the table, which of course is everybody in the world in the game. Because guess what? The carbon emissions are all global. It doesn't just hit one particular world power. And so with the oceans and the trees that you can build to kind of offset, that can be something that you can do as a world power that's going to benefit everyone else. There are also these other opportunities to invest in these global projects and players can choose to do that individually, but they can also talk about it because this phase of drawing cards and playing project cards is all simultaneous. This is like the play, the play part of it. Players are going to get these cards and you might have fewer cards that you draw because you have more communities in crisis. So there is a player um, card limit based on that particular statistic, which might be an individual detriment or, 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 or um, lack for certain world powers. But you're going to draw these project cards and you're going to be able to do uh, three different things with your cards. And, and that really helps me move into my next favorite point is the versatility of the cards and the locations on the board. Cards have tags and they also have this action or activation ability. And so what you can do in your player area is you can play a card on top of another card, but you splay it so that you get to reveal the icons from the previously placed cards. But the top card is the only card that is active, so to speak. And so you can play a card, a project card from your hand down into one of your five columns and then you're just adding it to the stack. And again, what you're wanting is that card's special power and you want the icons of everything behind it. The other thing you can do with your card is tuck it behind a card that's already out in one of those five columns. And you're not wanting it for the ability or the action in the text, you're just wanting it for the icons because you wanna keep the text on the top card active but you need the icons to maybe meet a requirement for a particular number or type of tags. 
And then the third way you can use a card is by discarding it to activate something. And you'll see a discard card. It's your blue card image with a brown line across it. And it says to discard a card, then you'll get to do the action on this card. So you will simply just take any card in your hand that you drew and it's your currency. It's your payment for activating another card's ability. And that's just using those project cards in your player area. You can contribute cards to either uh, revealed crisis cards that need requirements to kind of mitigate the damage, or you can also add cards to project cards that need particular types of tags or just a simple number, requisite number of cards. So there are several places you can play your cards out, and some players even have the ability to pass cards to other players who need that card in their player space. So cards are so versatile and they have a whole lot of information and you really do like all of them and you want to use them all for not only their text and their ability, you really want to use them for their tags as well. But you really start gaining momentum by by splaying and stacking your cards and getting a really, really nice amount of generated potential for each of those five columns that players have in their player area for their world power. And now I just simply want to move into my third favorite thing that I really like about Daybreak because this is the thing that brings it all together. This game is so thematically on point and it also does it in its components as well. So when you look in the back of the book, they will t or the uh, rule book, it states that um, Daybreak contains no plastic components or harmful uh, textiles. It uses 100% FSC certified wood and paper products. And then they tell you where to go for more information. And when you actually look at it and you open everything up, you do, you've got these trays that are just as easy to use and open and pack as any other kind of tray that is plastics based. Everything is wood or cardboard and you've got boxes and you know what it does? It, it, it just essentially shows that while this game has a theme, the theme is not just slapped on, it is intentional. And it also creates this real pressure for us to understand really how we're involved in not just the game world, but the world world. And it does so in a very subtle way. I say subtle. It's pretty obvious, but it's not like, uh, it's not on a soapbox. I have to say it really doesn't. It's not like, you know, affronting people with its, you know, ethos. And I think that's really, really cool. Everything is nicely layered. I've got that du dual layered boards for players to play with. Everything is clearly labeled. And I want to say probably the coolest feature about every single one of these project cards, I'm going to show you is that each card is going to have not just its own um, um, explanation on the card itself of what it is, it is going to have this code that you can scan at the bottom. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scan this one right now with my phone in front of you because what you do is you just put your phone out here and then you click the link of that particular card. I scanned direct air capture. And then on my phone, it's going to say local project, direct air capture. And then it actually gives you lots of information. It gives you the research. It gives you the context and the background for what this is and how this is a project that could possibly work and what it synergizes with. So there's an entire um, pair. I have three full paragraphs on just what direct air capture is um, to capture CO2 directly from the air and how you do it. Um, what people are actually like, what is the timeline for us actually, you know, doing this or uh, accomplishing this? It has gameplay notes. It says you must have two innovative uh, tags. So it's explaining what your requirement is at the bottom, which is the two innovative tags, the orange light bulb symbol. Um, and then you tells you exactly how to use the card. So if you if the card doesn't make sense and you're like, I'm not sure exactly how to use this or when to use this, you scan the code at the bottom and then it'll take you and explain to you everything. It says this token will function like a tree during the emission stage. And it just explains everything. It has a tag. It's called geoengineering. Then they have learn more. They have a link to direct air capture Wikipedia, direct air capture international energy agency, IEA, and six things you need to know about direct air capture from the world resource Institute. Take 
action, then if you want to take action outside of the game, you can do that. And then it has related cards. So the cards that really, again, work well with this, you've got your uh, direct air capture local project, cloud brightening, um, and then they have the very, very end where you can get to the game. That is just one card. And here's the stack of all the project cards. They have a code for every single one of these that fully explains what the concept is, what the process is, how we're doing it, how we're working on it, and maybe what steps you can take too. So it's kind of taking this idea, this complex idea of, of working uh, with each other cooperatively to tackle the problems of climate change and knowing that we're all in it uh, together. We're all in it in one whole group. And I have to say, just getting back to the game itself, it doesn't matter which world power you are or that you're playing, um, which reflects the current status of all those different world uh, powers. You have to work together. You you have to. There's no way to win the game. A la pandemic. I mean, this is this is by the same creators as pandemic, so it does have that cooperative feel, but it gives so much autonomy to individual world powers. But again, there is a working together that is absolutely necessary. You can't neglect the projects that you're working on as a collective whole. You can't neglect the powers that you have to help other powers at the table and they have a balance or a suggestion for the amount of players that you have at the table and i know that bgg also says this game is best with two to three players and i have to say that the times i've played it have been with two and three and i have thoroughly enjoyed the two and three player games that i have played i look forward to the solo version of this the solo variant but I think that this game offers players so much more than just a game, and I think it might be the best game that simulates or represents what kind of crisis we're going through in real life without being, again, too didactic or too soapboxy. And I think that's important. I think it can be really hard sometimes to, you know, have these games that are trying to like give insight into things that are problematic or um, contentious or um, controversial. But I think they do this so well. And I think Daybreak is a brilliant game. It's, it's a great game, mechanically speaking. And I think because it started with the heart of the theme and then used a lot of wonderful cooperative play with simultaneous actions, it just has a nice, nice feel to it. And they even said it was inspired by their love of games of Wingspan, Terraforming Mars, and Race for the Galaxy. And I have to say those are some of my all-time favorite games. And so for me, this style just absolutely fits. It just fits so well, it feels so good, and it feels nice to play. So I always wanna play this game. And I have to say my loss record is higher than my win record. And I think that's great. I think it's, I think what it does is creates those emotional experiences for me. And it really keeps this fresh in my mind as such a challenging game. And I just keep wanting to play again and again, because I want to try again that solo play. And I, I want to keep playing those different countries and so, or, or world powers. So there's just a bunch to dig, you know, just sink your teeth into. And I didn't talk about every little bit in this game. It was really just those three things that I like. And that third one is just such a big piece. The theme married with the mechanics, married with the components, it's just so strong and memorable and replayable. So can't say enough good things about Daybreak. Again, I think it's the best game trying to do what it does in its field. So that's it for me this time. I will see you later, folks. Bye. Noble Knight Games is your portal to all things gaming. Visit them online at noblenight.com, or if you're near downtown Madison, Wisconsin, you can enter their fortress, which features 5,500 square feet of roomy retail and gaming space. Noble Knight Games hosts daily game groups and events and a free-to-play board game library. Their storefront offers access to thousands of tabletop gaming products from the newest games and hobby supplies to rare collectible and vintage titles from all over the world.